Just a reminder, in about uh, a week, you're going to have exam one. So that's next week, Wednesday. Uh, we don't have class next week, Monday, because that's a holiday. So what uh, you're turning in a homework today, that's homework three. And you will get homework four assigned today, which is going to be a practice exam. And we'll go over that. Since it's a practice exam, it should take you about the same amount of time uh, as the real exam. So you should spend about an hour on it. And because it's a shorter homework assignment, we'll go over it in class on Friday. Okay, so this is the homework four uh, that's going to be posted. Uh, this is just general instructions about uh, the homework itself. Um, it's worth 50 points like any other homework, even though the format of the practice exams is out of 100. So just take whatever score you get on that and divide by 2. Um, like I said, like I mentioned on Friday, you aren't going to get this back graded before the exam, so if you want to study uh, from, you know, you want a copy of what you actually submitted, then make sure to make that copy uh, before you submit it. And we'll go over the answers to this in class on Friday. I'm not going to be posting uh, any solutions to this on La Lima, so make sure you come to class on Friday if you want to know uh, what the answers to the practice exam are. And finally, it's a practice exam. Um, I try to make the real exam about the same difficulty, but that's kind of subjective. So if you find it's, you know, the practice exam is really easy, I'm not guaranteeing that you'll find the real exam to be as easy. Um, I'm also not guaranteeing that the problems that you see on the practice exam are going to be the problems that you see on the real exam. There's no point in giving you the same exam twice. Uh, part of the exam is that it's a learning experience so that you actually want you know, a, a greater variety of problems so that you, you learn more from it. Um, so you should not, your only form of studying should not be just doing the practice exam. You should be doing some other studying as well in order to prepare for the exam. Uh, the exam will cover uh, everything we talked about uh, about diodes. So that's chapters 3 and 4 in the textbook. I'm going to emphasize the topics in chapter 4 more and that's where we use diodes and circuits. Um, we'll also, exam 1 will also include uh, the amplifier topics that we talked about, the general amplifier topics, so amplifier models, uh, gain, um, cascaded amplifiers, that kind of thing. Nothing about op amps on this test. So anything that was covered uh, in homework assignments 1 to 3 and any kind of problem that is included in this practice exam itself. So the first page, or the next page, is the first page of the practice exam. Uh, this gives you the exam conditions. This is what your your real exams uh, cover page is going to look like. And so this is going to be the conditions that you have. So uh, no textbooks, no computers or of any kind uh, will be allowed, including phones. Uh, but you can use a calculator. Um, make sure you show all of your work because uh, if you don't have a correct answer, that's how you get partial credit. If you do have a correct answer, and I only see the correct answer, then you're only getting whatever points that answer is worth, not the points uh, for getting the steps up to that answer. And in some cases, you might not even get those points because I don't know if it was a guess or not. So even if it seems trivial, 
like you just calculated something based on Ohm's law, write down the steps that you did uh, in order to get that answer. And um, since I'm not allowing textbook or anything like that, I don't expect you to memorize all of these equations. So you can bring in a sheet of eight and a half inch by 11 inch paper, standard uh, letter size paper, and write whatever you want on it. You can use both sides, um, but it has to be handwritten. So you cannot uh, make copies of something, don't create it on the computer. Um, make sure you just you, you handwrite all of those notes. And I will check the sheets uh, before I give you the exam. So if you don't follow those rules, then um, you might not be able to, or you will not be able to use the sheet if it doesn't uh, conform to these rules. Any questions on the exam condition? Okay, uh, on the practice exam, there's four problems. On your real exam, there will be four problems as well. So on the practice exam, you have a, a diode problem. A diode circuit need to find voltages and currents. Uh, a rectifier circuit. And a uh, voltage regulator circuit. And then you have the problem on amplifiers and also a second problem on amplifiers. Okay, so that's that's what's covered in the practice exam. And you have similar kind of coverage in the real exam, but the problems won't be the same, exactly the same. Okay, so this will go on La Lima um, right after class. Any questions on uh, anything related to the exam? Okay. If not, then let's go back to talking about op amps. This is where we um, left off last week. So we said that the uh, input resistance of an inverting op amp is going to be equal to the value of that resistor, R1. So since it's a finite uh, input resistance, it's not uh, as desirable. But we can do some modifications to make an inverting op amp, but still achieve a, a larger input resistance. Okay, so this configuration where we uh, add a, a couple more resistors in the feedback path will give you an inverting op amp with an increased input resistance. So instead of just resistor R2 in the feedback path, um, I added another resistor R4, and between R2 and R4, there's a resistor R3 going to ground. Okay, so this makes the input resistance greater. And so let's uh, do some circuit analysis and figure out uh, what, is, what is going on in this circuit exactly. Okay, so let's first find, or let's first write an expression for I1, the current through resistor R1. And the voltage at that node is V1. So what's my equation for I1? So I1, oh sorry, the voltage of this node, uh, voltage of this node is not V1. The, 
um, because of the virtual ground condition. The voltage at this node is zero volts. So what's the um, equation for I1? So it's going to be the voltage at this side of R1, VI, minus the voltage at the other side of R1, zero volts over R1, or VI over R1. And let's also relate I1 to I2. How is I1 related to I2? That means we're doing a KCL at this node. They're equal to each other because I have no current going into the input terminal of the op amp because the input resistance to the op amp itself is infinite. Okay, so um, I have an equation for I1. I know that I1 is equal to I2. Uh, now let's write, or let's figure out the voltage at this point in the circuit, which is node X. So let's write an equation for the voltage at node X. What is that going to be? I want to write this in terms of known voltages in my circuit and known currents. So I'm not going to use any information on this side of the circuit, this right half of the circuit, because I don't know those voltages and currents yet. So how can I get an equation for Vx? How does Vx relate to the voltage at this point in the circuit, the zero volt point? Zero, zero volt node. Okay, if I wanted to write uh, an equation for I2, I could write it as zero volts minus Vx over R2. Okay, so if I do some algebra on that equation, it's going to be 0 volts minus I2 times R2. And that's also another way of looking at how to find Vx. It, Vx is going to be the voltage at this point in the circuit minus the voltage drop across resistor R2. Okay, so since that's zero volts, it's negative Vx is negative I2 times R2. And I know that I2 is equal to I1 and I know that I1 is VI over R1. So the voltage at VX, if I make all those substitutions, is negative R2 over R1 times VI. Okay, now let's uh, find out 
what the current i3 is. Okay, what's my equation for I3? Voltage at this side of the resistor minus voltage at the other side of the resistor divided by R3. So what is that? Voltage at this side of the resistor is zero. Minus the voltage at the other side of the resistor, which is Vx, and divide by R3. Okay, so it's negative Vx over R3. And I know what Vx is in terms of uh, Vi. So if I make a substitution for Vx, this becomes R2 over R1 times R3 multiplied by Vi. We're doing all of this so that we can figure out what the output voltage is going to be. Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide. So let's now determine I4. Okay, so what is I4 going to be? Yeah, I can just do KCL at X. So I4 is leaving the node. So it's equal to the currents entering node X. And if I substitute everything that I have so far then that's uh, what I4 will be equal to and now we can use this to figure out what the output voltage will be So the output voltage Let's do a uh, a KVL around this loop So can I get an equation for output voltage? going to be Vx minus the voltage drop across resistor R4. And the voltage drop across resistor R4 is I4. I'm oh, sorry, I missed a, a plus sign here. So it's I4, which is everything inside the parentheses, times R4. Okay, and now I can find 
what the gain is. I just need to take out uh, VI and move it over to the left hand side. Left hand side. So it's negative R2 for R1 minus R4 for R1 minus R2 R4 over R1 times R3 or we can uh, make this look a little nicer And that's going to be my voltage gain equation. Okay. Now if I want to do uh, the same thing, this is my upward voltage, oh, sorry, my gain equation from the previous slide. I want to achieve the same thing as I did before when I had the, the standard uh, inverting amplifier configuration. Uh, so I want to have an input resistance of 1 mega ohm. And I want to have a gain. I want to have a gain of negative one hundred and one mega ohm. And I don't want to use any resistor larger than a mega ohm. This first term in my gain equation is my original gain of my. Uh, uh, inverting op amp. But I have these other terms here that help to increase the gain, or can help to increase the gain as well. So, now in order to meet this specification, I'll choose R1 is equal to 1 mega ohm. So I'm not changing the input resistance of this, this op amp. I still have an input resistance that's equal to R1. But I am changing the gain of the inverting op amp. It's still inverting because I still have this, this negative sign in the gain. But I have these other terms, uh, this R4 over R2 and R4 over R3, that help to increase the gain. Okay, so. Um, I want my input resistance to be a mega ohm, so I'll set R1 is e equal to a mega ohm, and then I'll meet that specification. At the same time, I want to have a gain of negative uh, 100, and I don't want my resistors, resistors to be larger than a mega ohm. So I want to maximize gain from this point onwards, because I already met my input resistance specification. So, since I want to maximize gain, I want R2 to be as large as possible. So I'm going to choose R2 equal to a mega ohm because that's the this is my uh, my specification for the largest resistance that I can use. Okay, so if I do that. Uh, let me rewrite it. Then my gain equation is going to be negative 1, because R2 and R1 are equal. And then my other terms. Uh, oh, and this is a mega ohm, because I set R2 to 1 mega ohm. Okay, so what resistor value would I pick next? Um, 
I don't want to pick R3 yet, I think. Let's just concentrate on maximizing the value of this term first. R4 over R2. Yeah, so I want to make this, this term, the second term, R4 over R2, as big as possible. So now I'm going to choose R4 to be the largest resistance value that I have, which is a mega ohm. Okay, so if that's the case, then my gain becomes negative 1. That second term also becomes 1. R4 was a mega ohm. Now all I have left is R3. And I want this gain to be equal to negative 100. Now if I solve this equation for R3, then R3 is equal to about 10 kilo ohms. Okay, so because I have these extra terms and extra resistor ratios in my gain equation, uh, I don't have to have, all of my resistors can be a mega ohm or less, but I still can meet the gain specification of negative 100 while also having an input resistance of 1 mega ohm. So adding this uh, T network in the feedback path of the inverting op amp didn't actually help my input resistance, but it did help to give more gain to the inverting amplifier, so I can make R1 uh, larger, but still get a reasonable amount of gain. Okay, um, let's take another look at, or let's take a look at another type of, of inverting op amp circuit. Okay, so this is an inverting op amp circuit because I have my feedback resistance and I have some inputs connected to my inverting input uh, through some resistors. So if I had, uh, if I didn't have V2 and all these whatever voltage sources all the way up to Vn, and I didn't have resistors R2 all the way up to Rn, I only had V1 and R1, it would just be a normal uh, inverting op amp. So now what I'm doing is at the inverting input, I'm just adding a lot of voltage sources and resistors in parallel to the original uh, inverting op amp circuit. And this circuit is called a weighted summer circuit. So how would we analyze this circuit? I want to figure out what the what the gain is, the, the output voltage for this circuit. Uh, I could, um, you could do circuit analysis again, uh, like um, how we how we derive the output voltage for the uh, inverting op amp to begin with. But since we know that um, we can just break this down. Like if I didn't have, if I only had one voltage source and one resistor, it looks like an inverting op amp, right? It looks exactly like an inverting op amp. If I got, if I got rid of these, this is an inverting op amp circuit. Okay, so since I know that, I don't actually want to go through and derive everything again. So if I don't want to do that, how would I analyze this circuit? I have a lot of independent sources, and I want to see what the output is as a result of those multiple independent sources.
Nobody remembers? Do you remember um, superposition? So what do we do? What do what did we do when we wanted to analyze a circuit by superposition? Yeah, so I turn off all the sources except for one, look at the output, then turn off that first source, turn on another source, only one source at a time, look at the output. And I do that until I looked at all the sources, and then it, the output is the sum of all of those. So this applies to op amps as well. So we can do a uh, superposition here. So uh, In that case, um, I can just say that since all of these are sharing the same feedback resistance value, I can just write my solution in this form. Oh, sorry, this is V1. All the way up to I have N amounts of voltage sources. So if I only had uh, my one voltage source V1, my output voltage is negative RF over R1, which is the same as, uh, I'm calling it RF this time, but it used to be negative R2, this was R2 over R1, so same thing. But now I'm adding the contributions of all these other uh, voltage sources here. Okay, so because the output of this circuit is summing all of the inputs and I can weight the contribution of each input by adjusting the resistance value at each input, R1, R2, and so forth, then this circuit is called a weighted summer. And it's a more complex inverting op-amp circuit but it's just based on the superposition of all of these sources. Okay, let's look at a different type of op-amp. So this is the non-inverting op-amp now. This uh, configuration also has two resistors, R2 and R1. The feedback resistor is also connected to the uh, inverting input. R1 is also connected to the inverting input, but R1 is grounded. My input voltage is now going into the non-inverting input. So that's a clue that this is the, the non-inverting op-amp configuration. And so the gain of this will not be negative, uh, it will be positive. Okay, and let's uh, derive that. So, how would we uh, figure out what the gain is of this circuit? In other words, let's just figure, let's figure out the output voltage, and we'll di uh, divide by the input, and we'll get the gain. So, the first step that we're going to do is we're going to use the virtual short condition. So remember the, the voltage at uh, the non-inverting input terminal is going to be the same as the voltage at the inverting input terminal. Assuming that this op-amp is ideal, so its open loop gain is infinite. 
Okay, so if we make that assumption, the voltage at this node, which is labeled V1, is going to be equal to the voltage, the input voltage VI. Okay, that's our property uh, of the virtual short. Uh, second step we're going to do is we're going to note again that, oops, uh, let me not call it R. Let's just say that there's no current going into the op amp input terminals. Okay, so there's no current going into the non into the inverting input, and that means that I'm labeling I2 and I1 here. They're in the a different direction than what we did with the non with the inverting op amp, but that's okay. So if I do KCL at this node, oops then I know that I1 is equal to I2. Okay, and then now let's write an equation for the output voltage. So the output Voltage is from this point in the circuit to ground. The voltage from this point in the circuit to ground. So how would I write uh, the output voltage in terms of uh, R1 and R2 and the currents through R1 and R2? Let's do a KVL or on this loop. Uh, so the question is, does the virtual short mean that the output voltage is zero? Oh, okay, okay. Um, so you're talking about the, the the common mode rejection, and we said the property of the ideal ideal op amp is that the output voltage is zero if v1 is equal to v2. That's true for the ideal op amp by itself. No feedback. Yeah. Okay, so, so we added some external circuitry to this thing, so we're changing it. Okay, so the output is, is, is not zero. Um, the virtual short is just coming from uh, our model for this op amp was our open loop gain times, let's call this V2, V2 minus V1. And that was connected to the output terminal. Okay, so V out is A times V2 minus V1. And this A is infinite, so when I did V out divided by A, this went to zero. And so V2 is equal to V1. That's how we get our virtual short condition. And that will hold true even if I have this stuff connected to it. OK, um, so let's figure out what this output voltage is by doing a KVL around this loop uh, given by the, the arrow here. So what's my KVL equation? OK, 
Okay, so V out equals R2, R2 plus I1, R1, right? And that makes sense because I'm saying that my output voltage is from this point in the circuit to ground. That's also saying this point in the circuit, I have a ground over here. So if I want to figure that out, I just need to know the voltage drop across resistor R2 plus the voltage drop across resistor R1. Okay, and uh, given this equation, I can recognize that I1 times R1 is equal to V1. And from uh, step one, I know that V1 is equal to uh, VI. So I can make that substitution. Um, let me figure out what I2 is. So let's, let's solve for I2. So let's write an equation for I2. And I can do that by actually writing an equation for I1, because I2 is equal to I1. So what's my equation for I1? V1 over R1. And that will be equal to I2 because I said that I1 is equal to I2. Okay, so I can plug this in to here. And my output voltage will be equal to R2 over R1 times VI plus VI. Or, in other words, my gain, v, uh, the output voltage divided by VI, is 1 plus R2 over R1. Okay, so my gain is positive. Looks almost like the... Um, inverting amplifier magnitude, except I have plus one here. Now again, our gain is not uh, infinite, but we still have that feedback resistor R2. So that feedback resistor R2 is lowering the gain of my op amp, but it's helping to keep it stable. And this time, so, so we'll look at gain stability again, right now. But we'll look at it uh, in a different way. So last time I gave you some numbers. Uh, I gave you some possible open loop gains, and we looked at the gain of the, the inverting op amp. Now we'll look at it um, a little bit more uh, qualitatively. So I won't give you any numbers. We just need to kind of think about what's going on with this circuit. Okay, so let's look at the circuit, and what we're trying to do is, is have a constant gain, um, no matter what happens. So let's say that I had a uh, increase in my input voltage. Okay, if I if I have a constant gain, that means I should have a proportional increase in my output voltage to maintain the the same gain. So how does that happen? So if this input voltage, if VI increases by a little bit, then that means I'm going to now have a, a slight difference between V2 and V1 because I just increased VI a little bit. Okay? And if that increases, my output voltage uh, is also going to increase as a result of that. So if my output voltage increases, then that means that uh, V1 is going to increase. And then when I have an increase in V1, that decreases the difference between V2 and V1 now. 
So what happens is my input voltage increases. This difference, this is all happening almost instantaneously. The difference between V2 and V1 increases. It's not, it's not zero anymore. But then my output voltage will increase, which will lead to an increase in V1. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to make the difference between V2 and V1 go back to zero. So at the end of that, I will have a higher output voltage, but it's still going to have the same gain because my input voltage increased. So I'd expect a higher output voltage in order to maintain that same gain. And once again, all of this stuff is uh, happening almost instantaneously uh, in the op amp. Okay, let's look at input resistance and output resistance of this non-inverting op amp. What's the input resistance going to be? So it's looking into this terminal of the op amp. Maybe another question, or another way to ask this question is, what is this current? This current is zero because it's going into the input terminal of the op amp. So what is the input resistance? It's not, it's not zero. Oh. So the input resistance is infinite for the non-inverting configuration. How about the output resistance? That's zero. Same, same thing as the uh, uh, inverting op amp. So I have an infinite input resistance and a zero uh, output resistance. So this particular configuration is like your ideal voltage amplifier model. Okay, I'm going to stop here for today.